Playwrights Local presents Stranded, a podcast play, written by Edward J. Walsh, directed and narrated by Tim Tavkar, and featuring Agnes Herman, with sound design and editing by Angie Hayes. The setting is the New Jersey Shore, a month of May, in the present. Vicki Schultz, a young newspaper reporter, has carried emotional baggage to her new job. Scene one, day one. It is after midnight. Vicky paces before police tape with a cell phone to her ear, circling a recycling bin and trash can on the beach. A bench sits nearby. Hey, boss, it's Vicky. Just got here. It's one in the morning. They have police tape up, warning people off. Don't see any cops around right now, though. According to locals at a nearby tavern, it headed out, then turned and came back in. I'll try to confirm just what happened. Do some interviews, shoot some video, and bring it into the desk before getting on the mayor's story. Sorry for the loud noise, but the vandals are on the prowl. That's a local biker gang. A bunch of very bad boys, I'm told. Anyway, I figure I can wrap everything in the morning by noon. Give a shout-out if there's anything more. I hope to hell there's nothing more. Vicky takes a bottle of water from her rucksack and takes a swig. That was a message for Blanchard. Harry Blanchard, the editor of the newspaper I work for. Got this job a couple of months ago after getting caught in layoffs by my newspaper in Cincinnati. Needed to reboot. So here I am, on the beach at night in New Jersey, chasing down a story about a whale. Yeah, you heard right. A whale. Blanchard, he's got a stick up his rear about this whale. Says it's supposed to be a big one. Says you don't often see the really big ones anywhere near the shore. Somehow it got itself stuck at low tide, and later worked free at high tide. But some of the regulars at the tavern where I stopped to ask a few questions, and have a quick beer, told me this clueless whale later headed back to shore. Go figure. If the whale's still here when the tide goes out, could be he's stuck, stranded, like one huge salami on the beach. So I'm guessing he's not the brightest bulb in the ocean. Oh, the tavern's crowd did say this mentally challenged Moby Dick is a bull. In other words, a male. A male sperm whale. The kind Captain Ahab chased, much to the regret of his crew. Like how these people know it's a male, I have no idea. I have to admit I'd be curious to see how this whale's package measures up. (laughs) Come on now, admit it, wouldn't you? Some of the regulars at the tavern invited me to sit down and share in their bucket of blue crabs. Fresh out of a pot of boiling water, he said like boiling water is something to smack your lips over. They sat at what looked like a dissecting table. Crab body parts were spread all over. I went to work on a couple of blue crabs between swigs of my beer. Really, you need a book of instructions to dismember those suckers. Bottom line, I'd trade you a bucket of blue crabs for your order of three-way Cincinnati chili. That's spaghetti, chili, and cheese any day of the week. But remember... Please hold the onions. One of the old codgers at the table told me the sperm whale is the biggest toothed predator in the world. Not the biggest whale, but the biggest toothed whale. Hey, I didn't know there are whales with teeth and whales without teeth. I'm going to have to ramp up real quick on this subject. Back where I come from, a 70-pound blue catfish pulled from the Ohio River is newsworthy. But whales... That's for a quiet night on PBS. Oh, I do know that a catfish is a fish, and a whale is a mammal, and that's about all I know. I don't want to waste much time here. Blanchard says he'll be giving me the lead on a story about an alleged affair the mayor is having. Word is, he's betting the newly appointed female police chief. And guess what? She got a 10% raise with her promotion without council's approval. The sooner I close the book on Moby Dick, the sooner I can show Blanchard what I can do as a reporter. 
that could get me a reputation as the go-to person on the editorial staff, not to mention a badly needed pay raise. Well, it's Kirk the Jerk calling from Cincinnati. No, I'm not answering. Kirk's the guy I thought I would spend the rest of my life with. Except it turned out he was hooking up with somebody I thought was my BFF. You know, my best friend forever. That was Celine, my roommate. Get this. She was going to be my maid of honor. Anyway, Kirk wants to stay friends. Usually he calls me at night. And usually when the bars back in Cincy are near last call. And I usually tell him I don't want to talk to him and shut him off. And then after a while, he usually calls again. And for some reason, I usually answer. Then he likes telling me what a big mistake he made. My answer, in so many words, yes. No point in bouncing to a motel at this hour. I'll go back to my car, settle in, and get to work before the sun comes up. You know, like use some internet time to study up on sperm whales. Male sperm whales. What did I tell you? Kirk's a persistent pain in the butt, especially at this hour. Listen, douchebag, I canceled you out of my life and... Oh, God, I'm sorry, boss. Who did I think you were? Oh, some late-night creeper who keeps calling me for phone sex. Hey, what's up at this hour? Well, like I said, I I should have all this wrapped by noon. What about the mayor and the police chief? I mean, there could be a knockout story there. Readers would love it. Single copy sales would be off the charts. Oh, sure. Yeah, I'm down with it. No, no, no problem. Uh, What's your contact's name? Samson? Samson, like in Samson and Delilah? Oh, Charlie Samson. Okay, I'll look for him on the beach in the morning. Yeah, I'll book a motel room. Yeah, for the duration. Thanks. Vicky holds her phone in her outstretched arm. Not! Can't believe it. Blanchard wants me to roll with this whale story to the very end. He says Moby Dick either swims away into the ocean or dies on the beach. Either way, Blanchard thinks the story will play well with the locals. Whichever it is, I'm supposed to stick around for the finale. That could be a couple of days or more. But here's worse news. My point position on the investigation of the mayor and police chief was handed to a sketchy colleague of mine. An old-timer named of Ralph Punderson, who spends his day taking cigarette breaks outside the building. <laughs> Steps away, I should add, from the front door of the Shamrock Bar and Grill. Get the picture? Vicky searches through her rucksack for her prescription pills. Let me share my state of mind. I am pissed off. At Blanchard, at Punderson, and at Kirk the Jerk. Oh, and let me add to my list that brainless whale. Why didn't it head straight out to sea instead of turning back? Any animal that dumb deserves to die. Oh, damn it. I must have forgotten my pills. Early Alzheimer's. Well, I should be able to survive a few Zoloft free days. Maybe. Okay, it's back to the parking lot in my car. Until the sun comes up. Vicky tosses the water bottle down on the beach. Scene 2. Day 1, 10 a.m. Vicky is sipping coffee from a styrofoam cup. Sun's up, but I don't know if you can see Moby Dick out there behind me. I learned a lot about his predicament this morning when I met with Mr. Charlie Sampson. You meet a guy named Sampson, you expect someone who's ripped. You know, like Magic Mike? Well, this Sampson is no Channing Tatum. I figure he's 60-something, stands eye-level to me, short, skinny, oh, and balding. Best I can say is he did me a cup of coffee from his thermos. Turns out, Mr. Charlie Sampson heads up a group of rad volunteers who get off helping whales in trouble. And he says Moby Dick has plenty of trouble. High tide came in overnight. The whale came closer to shore with it. Now we're at low tide and he's pretty much stuck in shallow water. He's thrashing about some and slapping his flukes but going nowhere. The gulls have started alighting and pecking at his back. 
Mr. Sampson tells me they'll soon be going for the eyes. But things could get worse. With the sun out, this whale's skin will bake, burn, and blister. Volunteers are coming to slosh water over him by the bucketful. But he's too active for them to risk it now. Mr. Sampson warned me, no one should ever get close to a stranded whale's flukes. Other problems could also turn Moby Dick into a huge hot mess. Problem one, his weight will crush and suffocate him without the buoyancy of deeper water. Problem two, the buildup of gas from his internal organs could explode, tearing his insides apart, maybe even blow a hole in his body. Problem three, there's no telling when he last ate, so Moby Dick could be starving to death. Why is that? Well, a sperm whale likes to eat giant squid, sometimes diving more than a mile deep to find them. No chance of that here at the shore. If he is starving, Moby Dick is also dying of thirst. You see, he gets his fresh water from the food he eats. No food, no water. Oh, something else. This whale could drown. Yeah, drown. He needs to breathe fresh air every few hours. Gets that by rising to the surface, you know, expelling water through his blowhole and taking in oxygen. The sperm whale's blowhole is a single nostril, oddly placed to the side of his head. Ten minutes of fresh air and he's ready for another deep dive. But when the tide comes back in, if Moby Dick's lying to his side and his blowhole becomes submerged, he'll drown. Some finish, huh? A whale drowning in a strange place among strangers? A stranger in a strange land. <laughs> kind of like me here in New Jersey. The gawkers started coming this morning. They're bringing their kids, their lunches, and their dogs. Have to say, most people are pretty respectful. They're hushed up, almost like in church. Of course, the two auxiliary beach cops on duty aren't letting people too close to the whale. As for swimming, it's forbidden. Struggling whales attract sharks. Mr. Sampson, though, gets a pass from the auxiliary cops. They know him. He's free to roam wherever he pleases. Oh, it's Blanchard calling. He refuses to text. Says he wants to hear a real human when he uses a phone. So we are under orders never to text him. As for tweets, well, Blanchard's considering it. He's old school, and I do mean old. <clears throat> yeah, boss. You get the material I sent in? Mr. Sampson eyeballed him for me. Says this whale is more than 50 feet long. Likely weighs somewhere around 40 to 45 tons. Uh-huh. His size confirms he's a male. He could be 40 or 50 years old. He could live 10 or 20 years more by getting out of the trouble he's in. But if Moby Dick... You don't like that nickname? Okay, well, if this whale doesn't get to deep water real soon, he'll be a humongous pile of fillets. No, Mr. Sampson doesn't think his chances are good. Matter of fact, he says they're the poor side of lousy. The whale's struggles and the incoming tides just bring him closer to being permanently stranded. Hey, what's up with the mayor and the police chief? I is Punderson making headway? No, no, I, I'm just curious. Um, okay, it's forgotten. Yeah, I'll check back with you. You heard? Blanchard doesn't like me calling the sperm whale Moby Dick. He wants me to come up with a different nickname. Something original. Something catchy. Vicky holds her phone in her outstretched arm. Hey, boss, how about Wally the Whale? Has a nice amusement park ring to it, don't you think? Just kidding. Blanchard told me in no uncertain terms to forget about the mayor and the police chief. To focus instead on the way. What the hell am I doing here anyway? Huh? Oh, yeah, I need a job. Vicky sips the last of her coffee and tosses the cup onto the beach. Damn it, Vicky, don't let Mr. Sampson catch you trashing the beach. Vicky picks up her coffee cup. Earlier this morning, he picked up an empty water bottle and put it in the recycling bin. Right off, I knew it was the bottle I threw away last night. So what does he say to me? He says, I don't understand why people don't have the good sense to use the trash in recycling cans. Embarrassed me, you know. 
I mumbled something about how they ought to arrest clueless dorks who don't dispose of their trash properly, like I always do, starting now. Vicky drops her cup into the recycling can. Oh, crap. I just remembered. I've got an appointment with my new shrink at one o'clock. But if Blanchard gets word I've left here to go into town, I could get my pink slip. Better cancel. No Zoloft. No shrink. No mayor's story. I wonder if I'm headed for another crack-up. All because of that friggin' whale out there. Hey, h- hello. Vicki Schultz here. Uh, about my appointment this afternoon. I'm afraid I can't... You can't hear me? Well, sorry, I said I can't make my appointment this afternoon. Scene 3, Day 1, Late Afternoon. Mr. Sampson took me to lunch, his treat. I passed on the blue crab for a cheeseburger and fries. He loaned me these binoculars so I could keep an eye on Moby Dick from just about anywhere on the beach. And no, I haven't come up with a catchy nickname for this whale. I'll leave that for the copy editor. A few of those bikers shot past us on the way back from lunch. One of them gave us the finger while roaring full throttle around Mr. Sampson's Buick. Scared the crap out of me the way they came out of nowhere. Have to say, my driver never blinked. He kept easing along the highway like we were on Main Street, USA, while quietly answering my questions. Then he turned the tables, asking me about me. I don't know why, but mostly I stuck to the subject of me and Kirk the Jerk. How we met at a friend's Halloween bash, me wearing a Princess Leia get-up, Kirk dressed like Han Solo. I thought it was meant to be. How we left together that night, saw each other almost every day for a year and three months, and then we got engaged. And how it all blew up two weeks and three days later. Thanks, Celine, for carrying on with my fiancé. Slut. And wouldn't you know Kirk the Jerk calls me while I'm in the car trashing him? What's worse is I answer myself. I called him an asshole and told him I couldn't talk because I was working on a story. Then I apologized to Mr. Sampson. Told him I was having a tough day. His answer? In the seals, they say the only easy day was yesterday. For a little guy, Mr. Sampson has very big cojones. He was a Navy SEAL and went to work for a big-time aquarium after the service. That involved a lot of ocean scuba diving. Could never get over the majesty of the whales, he says. Now he does everything he can to save them, any kind, anywhere along this coast. But saving a whale is a Las Vegas long shot. That's not good news for the big boy behind me. The afternoon tide came in, and the smart money says our whale is bound for beaching. The waves curling up and under his massive body don't do much to support him. Gulls are pecking away with a vengeance, and I I noticed an odor, a bit of stench in the air. My lunch buddy tells me the odor will get worse, because Moby Dick is dying. Some blood's mixing with the water washing around him. Could be he was struck by a ship propeller or got caught in fish netting. Could be he's leaking blood from some internal injury, maybe from swallowing plastic garbage bags or mylar balloons mistaken for food in the ocean. Or, according to Mr. Sampson, naval operations, sonar, explosives, could have caused our whale's echolocation system to go haywire. That's how he navigates. But with its radar system screwed up, a sperm whale sometimes crashes into obstacles, say, a tanker. It otherwise could have avoided. <sighs> I don't know. Sounds a little like my life. Crashing into things I should have avoided. Like Kirk the Jerk. And that whale out there. With these binoculars, I can see the nasty scars on his body. What's with that? I wondered. Mr. Sampson says they came from grappling with giant squid deep in the ocean. The squid have large, wicked beaks and know how to use them. Oh, shit. I see a dorsal fin cutting through the water. No, I see two of them. Sharks! Jesus, that's hardcore! I gotta find Mr. Sampson. He'll know what kind they are and, and, and maybe what to do about them. Mr. Sampson! Hey, Mr. Sampson! Sharks! Sharks! 
Vicky runs off. Scene 4. Day 2, 1.30 a.m. He's not answering. It's 1.30 in the morning, my second day here. I'm searching for Mr. Sampson, but this time it's got nothing to do with sharks. Plain truth is, those weren't sharks I saw yesterday. They were dolphins. As Mr. Sampson told me, it's easy to mistake one for the other with those dorsal fins cutting the water. Duh. Yeah, sure. Thanks for trying to make me not feel like a derp. In other words, a dumbass. Right now, I should be in my motel room with a good book or a bad movie. It's Mr. Samson's fault I'm not. He called me shortly after midnight. I was awake when he called. Couldn't sleep. reason I couldn't is because I kept thinking about this whale. Why in hell, I wondered, did he turn around and come back to shore after getting free in the first place? No one knows for sure, but here's one theory. Our whale did it with full intent. And why would Moby Dick choose certain death, suicide if you will, when he could have swam free into the ocean? Is it because he somehow knows his time has come? Because he's sick, starving, wounded, whatever? And turning it over in his brain, which is, I learned, the largest of any known creature on Earth, Moby Dick opted to get things over and done with. I'm cool with that theory. I know, I'm attributing human characteristics to a creature not human. Pathetic fallacy is what it's called, something I learned back in my English lit classes. Pathetic. Yeah, that's a word I've ascribed to my own life on emotional bad hair days. Do you hear that clicking sound? It's Moby Dick. He's calling to his own kind out there in the ocean. I asked Mr. Sampson if they could hear him. His answer? You can hear that clicking for miles when you're scuba diving. It's like the beat of a giant drum. A sound so loud it can bust your eardrums. I like to think his kin would come looking to help Moby Dick if they could. Like family's supposed to. If that's a pathetic fallacy, it's one I'll keep. Thank you. Come to think of it, If I were to turn around right now and walk into the ocean, I'd be doing what Moby Dick has done. Except in reverse, going from land to sea to end things. Some British writer tried doing that. Walked into the ocean, meaning to drown himself, but changed his mind when he was stung by a jellyfish. Kind of thing that would probably happen to me. Who was that writer? Oh, Waugh. It was Evelyn Waugh. Funny the things you remember from lit classes. Hey, now don't be calling 911. I'm not walking into the ocean. I'm just going to look for Mr. Sampson. Oh, but I didn't tell you about the phone call from him that brought me here. Well, he had crashed somewhere on the beach for the night to watch over our whale, of course. He called to say he saw someone running along the shoreline with a spear gun. Mr. Sampson worried what this wingnut might do. You know, pull the trigger on the weapon and tell everyone how he, and I'll bet you a bowl of Cincinnati chili, it is a he, stuck it to a big friggin' real-life whale. Think it couldn't happen? Mr. Sampson says there's no telling what people will do. Says there's a crazy element that pumps bullets into whales for the fun of it. From the shore or from their boats. It was his phone call got me jetting down here. Don't know if I'm more worried about him, the whale, or missing out on a surreal part of the story for my editor. Must be last call in Cincy. (laughs) Right, it's Kirk the Jerk. Jesus, I'm so afraid right now I am actually thinking about talking to him, telling him about our whale here at the shore. What am I doing? I'm here to find Mr. Sampson. He could be hurt, sick, drowned for all I know. Mr. Sampson! Mr. Sampson! Where the hell are you, Mr. Sampson? Mr. Sampson! Scene 5. Day 2, 7 a.m. Vicky is sleeping on the nearby bench. She sits upright. She looks at her watch. Oh, damn it. Two days here and already I fucked up. 
I told Mr. Sampson I'd keep watch on our whale, but I kicked back here on this bench for what was supposed to be a couple of minutes. Except I dozed off. Let me explain. I caught up with Mr. Sampson last night. That was after he caught up with the dude carrying the spear gun. Asked what he was up to, this character pointed the nasty end of his weapon in Mr. Sampson's direction. Huh, call that an epic mistake. Mr. Sampson got a bloody lip doing it, but he flattened the guy. And with a kick in the ass, sent the weirdo off and running. Sans spear gun. Lesson learned? Never mess with a retired Navy SEAL. God, I am starting to love that man. Wish I had met someone like him, instead of you-know-who. Not to mention some other sad you-know-whos in the past. Oh, in enough about bad choices. Let's talk about bad news. Our whale is without a doubt stranded on the beach. You can smell the stench. Hear his gasping breath. See his enormous body collapsing like a huge tent. The lab people... Federal and state officials with their coveralls, gloves, masks, and goggles are due here any time. They'll see to it that Moby Dick is dispatched. Killed. In the most humane way possible. Otherwise his death would be terribly slow and painful. Our whale will be given a sedative. Then a major artery where his tail meets his body will be cut. He will bleed out. He will die. After that, major organs will be taken by knife-wielding scientists for study. It isn't often these brainiacs get a close-up look at a sperm whale's entrails. Okay, so how is it I woke up on this bench this morning at this hour? After his nighttime foot race and confrontation with the spear gun guy, Mr. Sampson needed a decent breakfast, a shower, and a shave. Oh, and a little repair work on his bloodied lip. He could get all that at my motel, so I gave him the key to my room. While he's taking a break, my job is, was, to stay here and watch over Moby Dick. At least until the vans show up with today's load of volunteers. But dozing off like I did makes me a fail, and I own it. My God, do I ever own it. Hear that? those vandals who keep cruising the area. They pride themselves on being one percenters. If you don't know, that means the one percent of biker gangs whose members don't give a crap about any law but their own. Hope our auxiliary cops are wide awake and on the job. I need to get my butt out there by our whale, check things out. I have to admit, I'm, I'm worried. But what is it somebody named Murphy said? Whatever can go wrong, damn well will go wrong. Scene 6, Day 2, Late Morning. Yeah, it's a beer. A cold one. A gift from their cooler by one of Mr. Sampson's volunteers. They were late getting here. Didn't arrive till mid-morning. Right now, they have a brigade throwing buckets of salt water over Moby Dick's blistered back. I'd do a shot with this beer if I had one. Might even do a couple. It's been a tough morning. Compared to what yesterday, as Mr. Sampson says, was easy. I went to watch over Moby Dick. Even before I got close, I could hear him gasping for breath. Hear his moaning, his calls of distress... Melville, I remember, described the eyes of a sperm whale as looking like the eyes of a colt. And with a dark, cultish eye, Moby Dick shot me a look. A look that stopped me cold. What I saw in that eye was intelligence, curiosity, alarm. For a time, I stood stock still, deciding whether I should get any closer. I was feeling like I was, I don't know trespassing or something but I kept on when else in my life would I get to press my hand against the flesh of this leviathan I wanted to touch him while he was alive feel his strength power otherness but I wondered hearing his call sweeping over the beach was he wanting me to help him or wanting to tell me something 
Were those calls for me? Or was I really cracking up? Again. Craziness, huh? I inched closer, sometimes pausing when Moby groaned. His eye held fast on me. I could see the lumps like plums in his looming black body. The blight of scars left by the beaks of the giant squid. And that eye, which had seen mysteries I would never see. Moby Dick's great flukes lay unmoving against the sand. But I remembered Mr. Samson's warning and stayed clear of them. Still, I longed to lay a hand on our whale. I stepped into his shadow but hesitated. Then I summoned up courage and walked to the other side of this behemoth, the side parallel and closer to the shoreline, to the ocean that was his home and lapped at his body. As I came around, the other of his cult-like eyes fastened upon me. I said to myself, what the hell? It's now or never. So I closed my eyes, reached out, and pressed my hand against him. And like I was doing some strange mind meld, I kept my eyes closed and my hand against that warm flesh for I don't know how long. Was it seconds? A minute? Minutes? When at last I opened my eyes, I saw it. An incision cut deep into Moby's flesh. A capital letter V, with the head of a pitchfork pointing upward from the base of the letter. And above the points of the pitchfork, the Latin phrase, vade ad infernum. I managed a little Latin back when, and the words were easy to translate. Go to hell. Spray-painted in bright yellow. It was, you probably can guess, the colors of the Vandals, their insignia and motto. And then I saw what did me in. A tear streamed from Moby's mournful eye. Yeah, a tear, which channeled its way slowly down that great block-like head. I was done. I collapsed into the sand. I... I wept, I swore, I screamed. I thought if there's a god, the fucking vandals would burn in hell, and maybe me with them because I let our whale down. I didn't watch over him like I promised. So that's where the volunteers found me. And gave me this cold one. I really could use another. And a shot or two to go with it. I think I might head over to that tavern, maybe get lit, then go back to my motel room and hide under the covers. No, with my luck I'd be found out, get fired, and end up homeless in Newark. I need this damn job. So instead I'm going to mooch another cold one. Scene 7, Day 3, Noon. Vicky sits on the bench, working her laptop. She takes a swig from the water bottle. It's coming to an end. On this, the third day, Moby Dick has been eviscerated, sliced and diced. The heavy equipment is here, digging a hole large enough to bury his body. And there's what seems like a ton or so of bagged lime to spread over his remains. Disposing of a beached whale is costly and complicated, especially a very big beached whale. The bureaucrats, local, state, and federal, were at each other about where and how to dispose of Moby's body. At a landfill, by towing him out to sea, or blowing him up with dynamite. After a lot of wrangling, they decided to bury him on the beach. It would be the cheapest, quickest way. But it is to be done without publicity or fanfare. You know, to avoid a public outcry of some kind. So the beach has been closed since midnight with real cops at the entranceways. And the authorities have made it clear. No mention is to be made that Moby's remains are here beneath the sands of the beach. By me or anyone else. That's quarantined news for the time being. As for the vandals, no charges will be filed. 
The prosecutor says there's no proof, no witnesses, that they desecrated our Moby Dick. Strong word, that, huh? Desecrated? Well, I'm cool with it. When I laid my hand against the warm, torn flesh of our Leviathan, he fell quiet for a moment. No moans, no cries of distress, no gasps. There for an instant, I believed he was at peace. That I somehow brought him comfort, just as somehow I felt comforted by pressing my flesh against his. Yeah, I know, my pathetic fallacy at work again. One of the volunteers told me Moby Dick couldn't possibly have cried a tear. Whales, he said, can't weep. They're ocean dwellers, incapable of it. No, what I saw was eye lubricant, not a tear. Give me a break. Whatever, however it came to be, what I saw was a tear. I'm as sure of that as I am of the tears I shed on this beach. And so is Mr. Samson. Oh, if you want to know what killed Moby Dick, the brainy types found his intestines clogged by a balled-up litter of plastic. Plastic bottles, cups, containers. Stuff we pump and dump by the megatons into the sea. It's Blanchard. <clears throat> yeah, boss, what is it? You don't need any more on the whale? Ponderson took a buyout and bailed on the mayor and police chief's story? Yeah, I'd love to get on that story. But not until later today. No, boss, I really can't come running right now. Because I've got a funeral to go to. It's a friend, a special friend, and I have to be there. His name? Oh, his name was Wally. No way I can miss it. Sorry, but that's how it is. Okay, you can let me know what you've decided after I get back from the funeral. Blanchard is not happy. He wonders if I have what it takes. What he doesn't get is our whale died hard. Real hard. But while he lived it, Moby Dick made the most of the life he had. And that's damn well what I am going to do. Starting now. No, it's not Blanchard. It's from someone else. A caller I won't be talking to anymore. Name of... Oh, you take a guess. Hey, I, I gotta run. Thanks for listening. See you around. Somewhere. Ricky drops her water bottle into the recycling bin. Wait up, Mr. Samson! I'm coming! The End You've been listening to Stranded by Edward J. Walsh in a production by Playwrights Local of Cleveland, Ohio. All original tracks were recorded at Bad Record Studio in January 2018, with post-production by Angie Hayes. This recording is copyright 2018 by Playwrights Local. Stranded is copyright 2017 by Edward J. Walsh. All rights are reserved. Playwrights Local is a non-profit theater company based in Cleveland. Build as a playwright center, our goal is to provide a home base for all novice and experienced dramatic writers in Northeast Ohio. We offer classes, produce original plays, and engage the community through outreach projects. Support for Playwrights Local is provided by the AHS Foundation, the Arch and Bruce Brown Foundation, the Cleveland Foundation, Cuyahoga Arts and Culture, the Cyrus Eden Foundation, the Shar and Chuck Fowler Family Foundation, the George Gunn Foundation, the Ohio Arts Council, and the Paul M. Angel Family Foundation. For more information, visit www.playwrightslocal.org.